Hello, this is Sean Holloway, Administrative Assistant for Faculty Initiatives at the American Association of Colleges of Nursing. Welcome to today's webinar. Please review the, the disclosures on your screen and I'll go over a few things before we get started. First, if you have a question, please type it into the chat box on your screen. Content specific questions will be answered following the presentation as time allows. The session will be recorded and will be available on the AACN web website under on demand webinars. At the end of the session, you will be given access to a program evaluation. It will also be sent to you in a follow up email. It is now my pleasure to kick off today's webinar CCNE Accreditation Standard 1 Program Quality, Mission and Governance. At this time, I'll pass the presentation over to Director of Accreditation Services, Lori Schrader. Lori? Thank you, Sean. I really appreciate that uh, brief introduction and those helpful hints to our webinar participants today. Um, I know that you mentioned that the webinar would be posted on the AACN website, but it will also be posted on the CCNE website. So our participants will be able to find it in two different spots. So thank you. I have the pleasure of introducing our three amazing uh, presenters uh, today. You're all in for a real treat. I'm just going to tell you briefly about their role, their roles within CCNE, CCNE and not all of their professional um, activities. And this is in alphabetical order. I am not playing favorites. So the first is Dr. Susan Rupert. She is a current member of the CCNE board. She's the immediate past board chair and currently serves as treasurer. She is a member and co-chair of the Accreditation Review Committee and also served as a member of this most recent standards committee. Dr. William Michael Scott, who we fondly refer to as Mike, um, is a past member of the CCNE Board of Commissioners, a past member of the Accreditation Review Committee, a member of the current CCNE Standards Committee, and he also served as past chair of the CCNE Budget Committee. And last but certainly not least, we have Ms. Jane Vogelweed, who is also a past CCNE Board of Commissioner member, past member of the Report Review Committee, and has had the um, distinction of co-chairing two standards committee, uh, this current most recent one of the 2018 standards, as well as the prior uh, standards committee for the 2013 standards. So I'm sure that all of you join me in welcoming our presenters today. So very briefly, our expected outcomes, this is what we hope you'll know by the end of this webinar, that you'll develop an understanding of standard one, that you'll learn about CCNE's expectations and the ways you can present evidence to demonstrate compliance with Standard 1 and its key elements, and also learn about when the CCNE standards go into effect and what resources CCNE is providing and so forth. I hope that all of you are aware that CCNE has been celebrating its 20th anniversary this year, 20 years of accreditation activity, so we just wanted to very quickly share a little bit of data with you regarding um, the number of programs that CCNE accredits, um, including the number of institutions and how those break down by degree type. CCNE also accredits, accredits residency programs. Okay, I'm turning it over to you, Jane. Thank you, Lori, and welcome to everyone who is joining us for the first episode of Better Getting to Know Your 2018 Accreditation Standards. We're very happy that you are uh, joining us for this phase of the rollout of our new standards. Uh, one of my favorite authors is Anne Lamott, and Anne referred in one of her books to the law of the American jungle. And the law of the American jungle is remain calm and share your bananas. And we are here today to share our bananas. And what I mean by that is that our standards committee members have emerged after 18 months of careful study and work on the CCNE accreditation standards. And we would like today and in the upcoming 
webinars scheduled for August to share some of our observations about the revised standards and what they mean for your program. As Lori pointed out, um, the members of the Standards Committee, not just the other two who are presenting today, but the remaining six members of the committee all have played a wide variety of roles for CCNE. They have all served as evaluators of programs and they understand very well how the standards work and what the process is. Um, I think it helps to begin by looking at the framework of the standards. There are, as many of you know, four accreditation standards. The first three deal with program quality, and the fourth deals with program effectiveness. So the first three of them are looking at components that CCNE believes are essential for a quality nursing program. And then the fourth standard looks at how you can demonstrate that the program is successfully doing what it sets out to do. And then each of those four key, uh, standards has key elements with elaborations and a list of supporting documentation. With my experience on CCNE, it really helps to take a step back and look at how these standards are organized because it gives you the bigger picture, it gives you a better understanding of what it is that CCNE wants to see and learn about your program and why. And before we move ahead, I want to pause for some good news. For those of you who are already familiar with the 2013 standards, um, I think it will be good news to you to know that the structure of the standards has not changed. We still have four standards and they are organized in just the way that I described. We did not, as a standards committee, put you in an entirely new vehicle. We're not switching you from a Honda motorbike to a Ford pickup truck. We didn't plunk in an entirely new engine. The components that we see of a quality program are still largely the same. There are some additional, a few additional components that have been added to the standards, although not in standard one. Um, but the changes that are made in the 2018 standards are not radical ones. I think it's more akin to upgrading the GPS and giving you a new set of tires. For all of you, whether you are familiar with the 2013 standards or whether you are relatively new to the CCNE process, we're hoping as a committee that these changes that we've made will help guide you. They, they are an improvement over the previous standards. Um, we've tried to add this clarification in a couple of ways. You will see, uh, including in the standard one today, how we have added some examples or we've modified language to try to make the expectations of, for programs more clear. In some cases throughout the standards, we have tried to add clarity by what I call stacking or unstacking, where we, if there are too many requirements, we've tried to break them apart so they're separate and more clear. Or if there are several elements that tend to duplicate each other, we will stack those up and put them together. We've relocated some things within the standards so that they flow and belong to requirements that are similar in nature or related. So what I'm saying is that a lot of the changes made in this version of the standards uh, you could consider editorial in nature and ones that we hope will make the standards more illuminating for you. One of your first questions will no doubt be when do these take effect? 
and these standards for the accreditation of baccalaureate and graduate nursing prog programs go into effect for all programs beginning January 1st of 2019. So that's four and a half months from now. Any program that is hosting an on-site evaluation or a program that is submitting a report to CCNE beginning January 1st, 2019 or after must use these standards, the 2018 standards. CCNE is going to make a number of resources available to you to help you do that. And this slide shows some of the resources that will be especially helpful to those of you who are familiar with the 2013 standards. There is a crosswalk table that compares the two, the 2013 and 2018 version. And there is a crosswalk table that looks at the criteria for evaluation of nurse practitioner programs in the 2018 standards. This is a table that will be of interest only to programs that do have a nurse practitioner uh, program or offering. Otherwise, it does not apply. Now, I want to just make a brief comment here. Many of you have used and are familiar with the document CCNE has called the Supplemental Resource Document. And you have told us that you have found that extremely helpful. I just want to tell you what the status is of that document. It was developed about a year to a year and a half after the 2013 standards went into effect. And it was developed because there were some areas where there were questions or the staff perceived that there was some confusion and it was to address those and help programs. Because the standards have now been revised and rewritten, that edition of the supplemental resource is no longer applicable. It is possible that there will be a future one, but we don't know that yet because we need to see how the 2018 standards work as they are implemented. I will note, though, that our committee worked very hard to try to address some of those areas of confusion in the revised standards. So we hope that some of those issues have been clarified. This, uh, I, one more point about the crosswalk tables. For those of you who are uh, chief nurse administrators or evaluators, those uh, two crosswalk tables are available on CCNE's online community. CCNE also provides uh, help to programs in providing the patterns or templates for the self-study for which all nursing programs, uh, all nursing programs must complete this. And uh, there is a worksheet for the NTF criteria that applies to programs who are preparing nurse practitioners. And this worksheet now incorporates the 2016 NTF criteria. Those criteria, which are the most recent that were adopted by the National Task Force, are, are now required in the 2018 CCNE standards. That's one of the changes we made in the standards was to incorporate that version. All programs must submit a midterm report, a continuous improvement progress report, and there is a template for that which will reflect these 2018 standards. And then a template for substantive change notification. As many of you know, there are certain changes in programs that require that CCNE be notified. And these include things like if there is a change in the mission of your program, a change in its legal status or control, if there is a ch an addition of a new program, or for example, if there's a change in your program status with your state board of nursing. Uh, those and more require notice to 
uh, CCNE, and there's a template through which that can be communicated. So all of these will incorporate the new 2018 standards and be of help to programs when providing the information that CCNE needs. Thank you for that, Jane. I just wanted to um, interject here. We're getting a number of questions about when the self-study template in particular will be available, and um, it already is. Um, to, um, I believe you said that when you started talking, but um, just wanted to really reiterate for the group that if they go to the CCNE website, the self-study template is currently available. Um, and it has been um, delineated, um, uh, differentiated from that of the self-study template for the 2013 standards because, of course, programs that are being reviewed this fall in 2018 are still using the 2013 standards. So both self-study templates are currently available. And also the self-study template has been um, posted inside the CCNE online community. Uh, so uh, programs have access to it there as well. Thank you. Thank you, Lori. And when I looked at that this morning online, it is uh, the, the new templates are clearly identified as being those that apply to programs who will be using them for evaluations or reports after January 1st, 2019. So that's very clear from uh, the way the documents are titled. Before we get into the real nitty gritty of standard one, we want to give you just one uh, reminder. This applies to all the standards, but we'll start with it here today with standard one. It's very important that you read the standard itself and each key element and its elaboration statement in its entirety. Um, each sentence and bullet point throughout the whole standard is important and represents a requirement that the program is expected to meet. One of the things I want you to know is that when our standards committee considered the entire standards document, we considered and could have eliminated certain key elements or portions of key elements or portions of standards if we had concluded that they were unnecessary. We could have tossed them overboard. So you should assume uh, that anything that remains in the standards is important and it remains there for a reason. It's something CCNE does expect to see from your program. So I will turn it over now to Susan. Thank you, Jane. So now we'll move into talking about what everyone is here today to hear about, and, and that is the changes in the 2018 standards. Um, so we'll start out by talking about a little bit about some of the summary of changes. And as Jane has said, um, there's not a lot of dramatic changes that you'll see as we go through standard one and in subsequent programs, each of the standards. A lot of the changes that have been made in the revision were really to clarify things that, that we learned over the years in using the 2013 standards. Many of you probably participated in the open call for comments uh, before the revision process started. So CCNE's community of interest, which included um, all of its schools, faculty, students, organizations, um, were all able to contribute comments based on the 2013 standards so that as we moved into that revision process, we could really target in on the areas that needed some revision or clarification. So in looking at some of the changes in Standard 1, um, you'll notice as you look at the 2013 and the 2018 key elements that there is some shift in the numbering, and that's something as you begin to use the revised standards you want to pay a lot of attention to. I know sometimes there is a tendency to 
pull out your old self-study and, and cut and paste areas, particularly those areas that haven't had a lot of change. So as you work with the new standards, you really need to pay attention to where things have shifted to so that you don't put them in, in incorrect places. So you'll see on key element 1A um, that it now has been broken into two different key elements. And Jane mentioned earlier about the concept of stacking and unstacking. So this is one that was unstacked. Um, those of you familiar with the current 1A know that it talks about mission goals and expected program outcomes, and it also talks about the professional standards and guidelines that are used in the program. So that's a lot of information to write to in one particular key element. So to clarify that, that present element is now split into two separate elements, 1A and 1B. Uh, element 1C is now key element 1D, and there is clarification about what is meant by the term faculty, and we'll be talking about that in a lot more detail in, in a few minutes. 1F is still 1F, um, so it was previously the last key element in standard one, but with the renumbering now, we have added some additional key elements, so it's no longer the last one. Key element 4G in the 2013 standards is the one that talks about the process for um, formal complaints. That key element is remaining basically the same, but is now moved from 4G into standard one and becomes key element 1G because it made a lot more sense when you're talking about program um, mission and governance and policies in programs to really move that piece of the policy uh, logically into standard one. The current uh, key element 1E is now key element 1H, and this is an update and reordering, uh, particularly about the approved accreditation disclosure language. And again, we'll be talking about that in a little bit more detail. So these are the changes that are also noted in the crosswalk that Jane referenced earlier and uh, are available on the CCNE website. So with the exception of key element 1A that was unstacked, um, again, all the other elements have been renumbered. And there is additional items for supporting documentation that have been added into standard one, including some new language to help clarify what those expectations are. Uh, again, language has been added into that supporting documentation so now it very specifically states that the information that is listed there is expected to be included into the self-study document or provided on site. And you'll see that when we look at the supporting documentation in a few minutes. Susan, could you just talk um, a little bit more about um, the in, in the list of supporting documentation, and I know that we're going to talk about it more, so I don't mean specifically the items noted, but when you say that it's expected to be included in the self-study document or provided on site, can you just talk about that a little bit more, about making a decision between what you might want to include as an appendix um, or information that you, might be better to provide on site, for instance, um, faculty CVs or something like that. Right, thank you, Lori. Um, yes, you'll see that now the documents that are, are listed under the supporting documentation are not requests for, for optional information. Those items are to be included again, either as appendices in the self-study or somewhere in the narrative or on site so that the on-site evaluators will have access to it. It could be on site in hard copy. It could be in electronic form. Whatever is the easiest and most efficient way for the school, for the program to organize their materials 
CCNE is not prescriptive on that. Um, as Lori mentioned, there are some documents that are going to be extremely lengthy. For example, all of the faculty CVs. That's very lengthy and cumbersome to include within appendices and makes the self-study document extremely lengthy. So that would be something that would logically be better provided on site. And again, that can be hard copy or it could be in some electronic uh, format. Things like catalogs, um, all of the school or programs policies, Again, those are very lengthy documents and so are, are probably better to be provided on site by the program. Lori, this is Jane. To follow up on Susan's comment, it seems to me that uh, using the example of, of faculty CVs or uh, faculty output, if you will, one of the things a program will want to consider is to put in appendices things that we that CCNE needs to see the information in order to know whether that key element is met. So for faculty, for example, a table that shows the aggregate performance of faculty in producing scholarship might be something a program would put in the appendix because CCNE's evaluators will need to see what the aggregate uh, results are. But all of the individual CVs are not necessarily what CCNE is looking for. We're looking for aggregate information, so that could be made available, as Susan said, uh, at the time of the visit or online. Thank you, Jane. You know, one of the tidbits that we uh, always talk about when CCNE um, offers its workshop on writing self-study documents is that when a program's trying to make a decision, for instance, whether to include uh, information in its self-study, it should ask itself, will the team um, and the committee and the board be able to understand the document without these materials. And so I think that there are some things that really do lend themselves to being in the on-site resource room, and you're right, can be easily summarized in, in other ways. So things like um, complete syllabi, uh, CVs, maybe mem memorandum with um, you know, community partners and so forth. Those might be things that should be mentioned within the narrative of the self-study document, um, but wouldn't necessarily need to be provided as part of the appendix. But I don't want us to wander too far down, down that road. I just wanted us to give a, a little time to, to speaking to the fact that um, some decisions need to be made by the program um, as, when they're looking at that list of supporting documentation as to whether they should be including it in the actual document or just making sure that those materials are available to evaluators when they come on site. Okay, so standard one, this is the overall standard that has to do with mission and governance. And the good news on this is there is absolutely no change in the language in the standard itself. So the changes that we'll be looking at within the standard really have to do with several of the key elements. So key element 1A, again, is one of those key elements that was unstacked and broken into two different key elements. The requirements within the key element itself really are not different at all. So 1A now exclusively is really looking at just the mission goals and expected program outcomes, how they're congruent with the parent institution, and the review and revision process that the program has in place. So no longer does the program need to discuss the, the documents that it uses, the guidelines and other standards. That now is in 1B. So this really, too, 
in terms of the language, especially in the elaboration, really has not changed that much. The documents that are currently required under the 2013 standards are the same documents that are required under the 2018 standards. So the essentials of baccalaureate, master's, and doctoral education are still required for the appropriate program. Um, as Jane mentioned on the NTF criteria, that now has been updated to the 2016. Currently, programs under the 2013 standards have the option to address either the 2012 version of the NTF criteria or the 2016, because the uh, last version of it, the 2016, was really released after the present version of the standards. But now in the 2018 standards, that choice is no longer there, and the program needs to address the 2016 version. Um, the, uh, information is still there and still the same in terms of selecting additional guidelines, so that has not changed at all. Um, all of the baccalaureate programs, again, have to demonstrate incorporation of the baccalaureate essentials, same with the masters. All masters programs that have an NP track also have to demonstrate incorporation of that 2016 version, not the 2012. Sometimes the question comes up uh, for programs that have an RN to MSN program uh, where they don't either award a baccalaureate degree or sometimes they do award it along the way. In that case, a program really needs to demonstrate incorporation of both the baccalaureate and the master's essentials, and that's specific again to RN to MSN programs. For DNP programs, the essentials is still a required document. If the DNP program is uh, preparing nurse practitioners, so for example, programs that are BSN to DNP and the NP track is incorporated within the program, they have to demonstrate incorporation of the use of the 2016 NTF criteria. Um, if it's a, a, a BSN with a DNP that allows for a stop out at the master's degree or awards the MSN along the way, then the program needs to demonstrate also incorporation of the master's essentials um, because the student does have that option to stop out or to be awarded the MSN degree. But Susan, if I could just interject before we get too far, um, I think it bears repeating the, the comment that you, you provided just a moment ago regarding the requirement of programs that are RN to MSN needing to demonstrate incorporation of the baccalaureate essentials. So, um, if you could just elaborate a little bit on that, we are getting some questions. Um, I, I know that you specifically stated that if um, there's an R into MSN program, uh, regardless of whether they're awarding the BSN to those students or not, that they still need to demonstrate um, achievement of the baccalaureate and the master's essentials. Is there anything further that you would want to state to, to provide programs with further clarity? Well, the rationale behind that is because obviously the, the master's, the graduate degree, is based on the foundation of a baccalaureate um, preparation. And so with that being said, the program does need to demonstrate that they have provided within that uh, program that baccalaureate foundation so that they can progress within their program to their graduate studies. Now, as you look at, at the essentials, and even when you look at the master's and the DNP essentials, many of the, the elements within the essentials are similar with them. So it's not as if a program has to have a, a, a document talking only about one set or the other set. It's really looking at how that program has integrated both of those documents within their program. 
Thank you, Susan. We're, we're, we're getting quite a few questions actually about um, which essentials apply depending on the entry point of students into a program. Um, so let me just uh, pair it back to you to make sure that, that I understand and that all of our participants understand as well. So I'm going to start with the DNP if you don't mind. So if you have um, a DNP program and you are not awarding, and if it's a BSN to DNP, so the students have already received a baccalaureate degree and you're not allowing a stop out and you're not awarding a master's degree along the way, the only essentials that you need to demonstrate incorporation of are the doctoral essentials because the doctoral essentials include the content of the master's essentials. Is that correct? That is correct, Lori. Thank you. And then if it's a BSN to DMP program, so the students are prepared at the baccalaureate level, but the program is doing one of two things, either allowing students to stop out after they've achieved the master's degree or they're awarding the master's degree along the way, the program does need to also demonstrate incorporation of the master's essential. That is correct. Because there may be some students that, that do stop out at that master's and so their highest degree being awarded is a master's degree. So that's, that's the rationale behind that. And, and typically in many of those programs, um, what you see is that they front load a lot of the master's or their typical master's content at the beginning of the program before that stop out point and then continue on with more traditional DNP content after that. So, so it seems right. that maybe um, a simple rule of thumb would be if you are preparing students and awarding a master's degree, but they have not yet achieved a baccalaureate degree, the master's degree program is going to need to demonstrate incorporation of the baccalaureate and the master's essentials. And for a DMP program, uh, the only time a program would need to demonstrate incorporation of the master's essentials would be if they're choosing to award a master's degree at some point during the DNP program or they're allowing students to stop out and to graduate with a master's degree. That is correct, Lori. Terrific. Thank you so much for that clarification. Okay, so moving on to 1C, um, not a lot of change within this particular key element. Um, it's really looking at community of interest. And so the program needs to provide examples and talk about exactly who their community of interest is. So typically that might include obviously students, faculty, alumni, uh, staff, it may be community partners or agencies that employ the graduates. Um, it, it's up to the program to really define what that unit is for their program. So not a lot of change in that, Lori. For 1D, um, this has to do with faculty outcomes being identified by the nursing unit. They need to be written, communicated, and congruent what with the expectations of that particular institution. So you'll see, and this is a change or a uh, change in the elaboration, really adding more clarity to it because sometimes the question has come up, what do you mean by faculty? Um, and different categories of faculty, who uh, is this key element really addressing? So in the elaboration, you'll see that the unit identifies expectations for their faculty congruent with their mission, so that may include teaching, scholarship, service, practice, or any combination of those four or any other areas that um, the program wants to define. Now the expectations that the program identifies 
can vary by the different groups of faculty. So, for example, uh, let's say a program with full-time faculty have an expectation for their faculty in teaching scholarship. I think we jumped ahead here. Can we go back to the, the slide? There we go. Um, in all of those four areas, teaching, scholarship, service, and practice. But for their part-time faculty, maybe the expectation is only in teaching and scholarship. The program may employ contract or adjunct faculty and have totally different expectations for them. Perhaps for those faculty, the program only has expectations in the area of teaching. So there can be some variation in those expectations, and it's up to the program to define what they mean by faculty and what their expectations are. They can be the same, but they can be different. Okay, so keeping in mind for 1D, again, the outcomes are defined by programs, and so there is going to be a variation from program to program based on the mission of both the program and the institution. It can be different for those different types of faculty. Um, and to keep in mind as we go forward in, in future programs, whatever is identified as outcomes in this key element um, are really going to play into standard four when the program provides aggregate data for their faculty outcomes. So there should be a match between those two, if you would. If a program is identifying that the expectations for their faculty are in teaching scholarship and service, then in 4G, when they're providing aggregate data for their faculty outcomes, um, the expectation would be to see data in those three areas. So. Uh, that, that's a tie-in between two of the elements, between two of the standards. Thank you, Susan. So, Susan, Mike, and Jane, uh, you know, we get a lot of questions about faculty outcomes, and as Susan has um, so nicely articulated, we've tried to, the Standards Committee tried to further define what was meant by faculty by adding this parenthetical of full-time, part-time, adjunct, and so forth. So the, uh, let's make sure that I understand. So if there are different expected outcomes for different types of faculty, then the program would be expected to delineate what those different expectations are for those different types of faculty. Is that correct? Yes, that is. That is correct. Terrific. And then, um, of course, we're going to have a whole webinar on Standard 4. But when we're talking about and thinking about that aggregate data, would we organize that? Should programs organize that in such a way that if the outcomes for the faculty types are different, then they would be aggregating the data by those faculty types, but if there is an expected faculty outcome that applies to all types of faculty, then that would all be aggregated together. That's correct, Lori. And I might point out that overall, one of the changes in our standards in the 2018 version and this comes up mostly in Standard 4, but it's pertinent here to Standard 1, is that in the past there were quite a number of instances where CCNE was given individual faculty outcomes, and it was not aggregated. And one of the things our committee tried very hard to do was to make it clear, and in fact we dropped the any individual requirement for showing outcomes. We want to know the aggregate faculty outcomes. So 
as Lori said, if the if there are outcomes that are the same for all faculty, let's say certain aspects of teaching, then group all of the faculty together and give us that aggregate information. If the expectations are different by faculty type, then break it down by type and give us the aggregate data for each group. I think it's also uh, important here in um, keeping with the understanding of what we're trying to get at in terms of key element 1D, not only with faculty outcomes by category or types of faculty, but understanding that this particular uh, key element, this is where faculty outcomes would be and faculty expectations uh, would be delineated. But it's key element 4G in which uh, case we would need to see how, that, um, how those expectations are actually analyzed and how they are integrated in with promoting program improvement. Okay, I'm going to turn it over to you, Mike. Okay, thank you, Susan. So we will continue on uh, with key element 1E. Uh, this, to most of our listening audience, um, this should be no um, real big surprises here. Uh, this uh, key element is in keeping with the, um, the organization's valuing of faculty and students' participation, involvement, uh, engagement, and program governance. Um, and that the, the roles of faculty and students uh, in the governance of a program, um, that they're clearly defined, uh, there is uh, evidence of dissemination uh, of that um, of that definition, and um, and and how that is being used to promote participation from both of those communities of interest, if it's so defined in terms of faculty and students, and that faculty themselves are involved in the um, the development, the creation, the implementation, uh, the review and revision of uh, academic um, policy. Now, keep in mind here with this particular key element that uh, faculty and students in, involved uh, in policy decision-making, policy development, uh, are to be included regardless of the mode of educational delivery. Now, the committee, uh, we certainly uh, were aware uh, of the variety of pedagogical, pedagogical delivery models these days including online programs, but even if it's face-to-face -face in the traditional model in a classroom or online programs, um, we are uh, kind of expecting uh, that, that both faculty and students would be included uh, in terms of um, program governance. Now, we also recognize that there are challenges in promoting student involvement and um, programs are free to be creative and innovative in how to promote uh, such involvement. You know, some ideas that have come forward include making sure, uh, particularly with a program that may be uh, focusing in on uh, an adult population, an adult population that tends to work, uh, that they are publishing um, meeting dates um, and times in advance um, and allowing uh, such students to call in or somehow um, using a digital platform to be involved uh, in um, those types of meetings. The use of chat rooms, the use of uh, smaller programs with one-on-one um, -on -one interviews with students, um, all those are, could be examples of how to promote uh, involvement um, from both faculty and students. That's really helpful, Mike, and of course we want to make sure we get through all of uh, standard one today. I just wanted to ask uh, one quick question before we move on. Um, the CCME staff will frequently um, get asked the question by either programs or um, our on-site evaluators as to whether um, students having the opportunity to, um, you know, let's say the program has an open door policy, for instance, um, if that's a sufficient evidence of um, student involvement in program governance, and then I'll let you move on. Uh, well, yes, I mean, that certainly would be one, um, one example, 
certainly it is an open door, although the, the program itself may set limits on that, but, and there's, CCE is not prescriptive in terms of, um, uh, of which types of uh, policies that students may or may not be a part of, um, but uh, having an open door policy is such that, um, and, and making sure that students understand what, what that means, um, I think um, can go a long way in, um, in, in, in documenting this type of involvement. Okay, key element 1F has to do with uh, academic policies uh, at both the general or parent institution level and that of the nursing program, uh, that they are congruent and that they support achievement of the mission goals and expected outcomes. Uh, of the program, and that these policies are fair and they're equitable, uh, they are published, they are disseminated, uh, they are accessible to, um, to individuals, uh, and that they are reviewed and revised as necessary to continue fostering uh, program improvement. Now, it, sometimes it comes up that um, what if there are differences between uh, the policies uh, of the institution and that of the program, we do see sometimes um, that there are um, certain differences, such as in uh, GPA requirements, perhaps admissions, uh, grading policies, um, the need for prerequisites. And that's understood that those, those differences um, could occur, and as long as it's clear um, to, uh, to parties involved, then that should not be uh, a problem. But uh, regardless, CCNE expects that all policies uh, that are published uh, as such uh, will be implemented um, as the program uh, so entails. Program one, uh, excuse me, key element 1G, uh, the program defines and reviews formal complaints according to established policies and, and processes. Uh, this was previously standard um, in standard four and the previous set of standards. Uh, however, the committee thought that it fits more here in standard one uh, as it is related more to policies, and it's not necessarily data-driven. Um, and it has to do, um, and it fits more um, as we're talking about congruence with overall institutional policies. I will remind our listening audience that the United States Department of Education uh, requires that this information, um, particularly as it relates to complaints, uh, be collected, and it is best practice for quality improvement and remember that accreditation processes are all about continuous quality improvement. Key element 1H has to deal with that all documents and publications related to a particular program are accurate uh, and that a process or processes are used to notify constituents about any forthcoming changes. And this relates uh, not only in terms of that in hard copy form, uh, but in this um, rapid uh, uh, exchange related technology driven world, uh, things happen very quickly, um, particularly on the web. But it is uh, understood that regardless of where these documents and, and publications are proposed, that they need to be uh, accurate um, at, you know, at all times. This is the basic key element um, that focuses in on truth and advertising. And um, I think that this key element uh, is intended to assure uh, accuracy of documents and publications, including, as I stated earlier, electronic documents. Um, I think that um, there needs to be a process um, that the program uses for alerting constituents to changes, particularly if they happen um, um, uh, on the spur of the moment, um, and that involves such things as emails, um, make sure that there's um, uh, website monitoring, um, uh, making sure that um, programs provide evidence that processes have been used uh, to inform um, to inform of changes um, such as copies of letters or emails sent to constituents notifying them that a certain change has been made or is forthcoming. Uh, and noting that certain things that sometimes programs may leave off, sometimes accidentally, uh, such as um, um, uh, current off 
offerings, uh, outcomes, uh, accreditation or approval status, um, changes to an academic calendar, uh, changes in recruitment or admissions policies. Um, so um, be sure to refer to uh, the elaboration that uh, that um, that's included in this particular slide um, 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 about making sure and that those types of things that can change um, pretty uh, rapidly are kept up to date. We understand that this can be tedious, um, particularly if these uh, publications are over multimedia. Um, uh, but we will remind our evaluators uh, in the audience that if such discrepancies are found uh, during an on-site visit, then it is okay to bring these up and the program can actually make corrections uh, while the team is actually on site uh, if, they, if, if, um, if need be. So, um, Mike, I just wanna jump backwards for, for a moment because I wanna make sure that um, nobody's left with a false impression. I had asked you a question about whether having an open door policy um, and you know just students being able to drop by and share feedback would be sufficient evidence of, of student involvement in, in program governance. And there may have been a misunderstanding in your response. So I just want to clarify that that would not be sufficient evidence of um, a, a formal established structured way for a program to demonstrate that faculty and students are thoughtfully included in program governance. Of course, programs um, having an open door policy and inviting student input is, is welcome and something that we would expect in the continuous um, quality improvement process, but um, in and of itself, it, it would not um, be sufficient. I just wanted to make sure that, that there wasn't any confusion there. Um, so thanks for letting me hop backwards for for just a minute there. Um, yeah. So yeah, then, thanks, Lori. I guess I was um, looking at how uh, an open door policy could be uh, defined or construed, but you're right. That would not be a part of a formal process. You would be correct. Thanks, Mike. I appreciate you letting me interject there. Um, I know we're running a little long on time. I think we'll be okay if we go a few minutes over. I know that people may need to hop off, but please know that we will be um, archiving the, website, um, the webinar. So if you are not able to stay on, you'll be able to go ahead and, and check back in with us. Let's go ahead, Mike, and um, talk a little bit about one of the most common um, areas where programs have difficulty in terms of providing accurate information to the public specific to um, the program's accreditation status. Yes, and so the organization has had for, um, uh, for some time now a proper and standardized way if a, if a program chooses to disclose its CCNE accreditation um, status uh, either in hard copy written form or on um, on the web, uh, then 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 programs choose one of these two formats to do that. Um, one is basically web linked, uh, with its emphasis on that medium. Uh, the other is actually the location uh, of the CCNE office's uh, actual physical address in Washington. But one of those two. Uh, is is what is being what is expected um, in in terms of the um, proper disclosure, and for most of us, we were aware that CCNE the office has moved uh, uh, last summer, um, and therefore um, a lot of us uh, had um, and, and 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 we were such uh, so happy for the organization being able to move from its older site. That in the in the celebration mode, I guess a lot of us forgot to make sure that we updated our own site to make sure of that it was actually ac accurately reflective of where the um, office is now located. Um, so um, this is just a a, um, a comment to our, to our listening audience um, that all programs need to make sure that it, that the new address is. If that is what is being uh, used, that particular format needs to be updated to include the new um, uh, office um, in DC. 
My, um, I was going to interject too in terms of, of websites and such that uh, programs may have that information on multiple places on their website uh, in addition to the uh, School of Nursing website. Oftentimes an institution will have an institutional website that talks about all of the different accreditations across the institution or there may be links to publications like catalogs or student information fact sheets and such that have accreditation language in it. And so the program really needs to look at all of those to make sure that, that the statement is correct. So just in the interest of, of time, um, we, we do provide some examples of um, ways in which the program can present its disclosure language accurately and in accordance with the way it's described in the key elements. Um, so here you'll see it's with the complete address and phone number. It's also correct if you simply provide the link to CCNE's website. Um, some incorrect examples you can see in the first one. Um, there's this statement about uh, the baccalaureate degree program being accredited by AACN, which is, of course, not correct because CCNE is the accreditor. Um, in the second one, there's a statement regarding the School of Nursing be, being accredited. That's also incorrect because CCNE accredits degree and certificate programs, not the School of Nursing or the nursing unit. Um, Another example here, which is the one Mike was speaking to, is that the address information is incorrect. Um, so let's go ahead and um, get to the supporting documentation. Okay, Lori, so um, I'll, I'll start us out in talking about that, and that I know in the interest of time we're going to move rather quickly through this. I mentioned earlier this new uh, introduction kind of statement, if you would, to the supporting documentation, uh, stating that this is not re, uh, information that's a suggestion for the program, that these are items that really need to be provided either in the self-study or, or on-site in some manner. Um, number one and number two that you'll see here are the same. There is no change in, in either one of those. You can move on, okay. Um, the same with number three, that is, there's no change in that either. Number four is uh, an additional item that has been added in terms of identification of the program's community interest. This would be an example um, of an area that the program could address within the South study, particularly in key element 1C that talks about um, the program reflecting the needs and expectations of the community of interest. So that would be an integration within the self-study itself. Mike? Yes, and, um, and continuing, the uh, all policies related to appointment, promotion, um, tenure, or other documents um, that define faculty expectations related to teaching, scholarship, and service practice or other areas um, would something be something that an evaluation team would, would look at. Um, uh, six uh, major institutional uh, or nursing unit reports and records for at least the past three years, such as strategic planning documents, uh, any school retreats in which strategic planning is discussed, or other annual reports. Uh, number seven, uh, reports that have been submitted to or official correspondence received from other applicable accrediting or uh, regulatory agencies since the last accreditation review of that particular program. And eight, as I discussed earlier, all catalog student handbooks, faculty handbooks, personnel manuals, other equivalent information, uh, academic calendars, uh, recruitment and admissions policies, grading policies, uh, and degree or postgraduate APRN certificate program completion requirements. And I will comment just briefly on the remaining four. Number nine deals with program advertising and promotional materials that are directed at students. 
I will say from our discussions at the Standards Committee that there is increasing interest by CCNE in this, and especially in the concept of truth in advertising. So CCNE wants to see what these materials are and to know that they accurately present um, what the program offers to those students. Number 10, regarding documents that reflect decision making related to mission and governance. Uh, keep in mind that consistent with CCNE's values, CCNE is flexible in what kinds of documents these might be. Uh, CCNE doesn't require, for example, that you present minutes that document decisions regarding governance. It could be any kind of document that your program has used to capture and document decisions that are made. Eleven organizational charts for the parent institution and the nursing unit. Um, keep in mind that the CCNE accredits a wide variety of programs with different sizes, missions, structures, and operations. They might be public or private, research, teaching only. So all of them are good, but CCNE needs to know what your program is and how it is organized in terms of governance. And then finally, with regard to number 12 on policies related to formal complaints, there's two components here that CCNE wants to see. One of them is the policy, the institutional or program policy regarding formal complaints, and number two, uh, to see that the policy has been followed, that the program is acting consistent with those policies. So I'll Thank turn you. it back to you, Lori. Thank you, Jane. I really appreciate it. Um, and I appreciate the patience of our participants as well. Um, just so you'll know, the final pre-publication version of the 2018 standards are currently available on the CCNE website. And as previously mentioned, if you're an evaluator or chief nurse administrator on the CCNE online community, um, we're calling it pre-publication because it's not all fancy with all the colors yet, but it is the, the final version. And there are some other resources available to you online as well. We've got the procedures, um, obviously the standards, the overview of the CCNE accreditation process. We have some general advice for hosting a CCNE on-site evaluation, and of course, all the professional nursing standards and guidelines that CCNE requires. We hope that you'll join us for part two of the webinar series. Um, August 21st, starting at 2 p.m. Eastern. I'm sure that all of you join me in thanking Susan and Mike and Jane for their excellent, clear advice and um, uh, discussion regarding Standard 1 of the revised 2018 standards. And thank you to you all who stuck in there for the extra nine minutes. Much appreciated. All right, this concludes today's webinar. Thank you again to our speakers and thank you to our audience for joining us this afternoon. On your screen and in the chat box, you'll see a link to the evaluation form. If you'd like to complete this at this time, click on the link in the chat box. If you do not have time now, a link will be emailed to a live attendee. At the end of the evaluation, there'll be a link for you to click and download your contact hour certificate, which you can then sign and print for your records. Thank you all again and have a wonderful day.